ready to get started today? Let's see what God might do with his word today in our hearts. Amen? You know, we just sang a song, Lord, you know, you shake the darkness. And I thought, Lord, shake the darkness in me. If there's any part of my life that isn't in alignment with you, shake that. Shake it right out of me so that I can be fully aligned with you. Is that your prayer today? Well, God has a method of doing that. Let's get started today. Well, there's an old parable that is told about a man who, upon passing away, he left his sons, among many things, he left them 17 camels, and he had three sons. Three sons and 17 camels, and part of his will, he decided how those camels were going to be divided among his three sons. 17 camels, the first son was going to get half of the camels. The second son was going to get a third of the camels. And the third son was going to get one-ninth of the camels. Well, you have 17 camels, and if the first son gets half, there's an immediate mathematical conundrum. So they're trying to figure out, how are we going to do this? How are we going to honor our father and divide these 17 camels up the way he wants us to divide them? And they discussed many things but could come up with no solutions. So they went to a very old and wise man in their village and explained to them their conundrum. And he thought for a moment and he smiled and he said, I I really can't help you with that. But what I'd like to do is to give you one camel. So now they have 18 camels. So the first son gets half. That's nine. The second son gets six camels, and the third son gets two camels. And if you do that arithmetic, that equals 17. So now they have an extra camel, and they return it to the wise old man. Solving problems is a part of life. Solving them well is godly. Every one of us face problems. In fact, every one of us are problem solvers. That's a great lesson to teach our children and our teenagers and young people as they're starting to work, that all work is a solution to someone's problem. And therefore, we should do it with cheerfulness and with gladness. Solving problems is important for every marriage, every family, every church, every community, every company, and every nation. It is vitally important for us to learn the best methods for solving problems. John D. Rockefeller said, The ability to deal with people is as purchasable a commodity as sugar or coffee, and I will pay more money for that ability than for any other under the sun. Solving problems helps everyone. We're going to look at a verse in 1 Kings chapter number 3, if you'd like to turn there, about King Solomon and how he solved a problem. King Solomon was the wisest man ever to live. He asked God for wisdom, and God granted him that wisdom. And this particular incident is probably the most famous thing that King Solomon is ever known for, a decision that he made to solve a problem. It's in 1 Kings chapter number 3. And we'll start reading at verse number 16. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 16. Now two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. And one of them said, Pardon me, my lord. This woman and I live in the same house, and I had a baby while she was here with me. The third day after my child was born, this woman also had a baby. We were alone, and there was no one in the house but the two of us. During the night, this woman's baby died because she lay on him. And so she got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while I, your servant, was asleep. And she put him by her breast and put her dead son by my breast. The next morning, I got up to nurse my son, and he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't the son I bore. The other woman said, no, the living one is my son, the dead one is yours. 
But the first one insists, no, the dead one is yours and the living is mine. And so they argued before the king. And the king said, well, this one says, my son is alive and yours is dead. And the other one says, no, your son is dead and mine is alive. Then the king said, bring me a sword. And so they brought a sword before the king and he then gave an order. Cut the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive was deeply moved out of love for her son and said to the king, Please, my lord, give her the living baby. Don't kill him. But the other said, Neither I nor you shall have him. Cut him in two. Then the king gave his ruling. Give the living baby to the first woman. Do not kill him. She is the mother. When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. I want to talk today about the savvy sword. The sword reveals many things. The first one is that the sword reveals it is inadequate to solve problems. Here we find King Solomon used the sword as a threat. Kind of what parents do. They're children. That was a joke. It's okay to laugh in church. King Solomon used that sword as a threat. He said, this is what I'm going to do. This is the order that I'm going to give. But problems arise nation against nation because of ideologies. We war with one another because we want a particular ideology to win the day. In the 1930s and 40s, it was Nazism in Germany. More recently, it is radical Islam. But what will be next? What is going to be the next war? What is going to be the next problem? There will always be a next problem. And we find and we discover the reality of what the Word of God says is that the heart of man is really the problem. It is not so much the ideology of the mind, but it is the problem of the heart. Jesus made this very clear in Matthew 15, verses 18 through 20, when he said, But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. These are what defile a person. And here we find that Jesus is saying it is the heart that is the problem. Out of the heart work all of these things, which causes conflict, needing a solution. In James, the word says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. And so we find that when the sword is is unsheathed and it is brought out and it is banished in front of everyone, it is a great threat. But in the reality, it does not solve problems. And Solomon understood this. It was going to work as a threat, but not a reality in its action. But the second thing that the sword reveals is the limitations of compromise. We live many times by compromise. We negotiate with one another. But yet the sword shows the limitations of those compromises. In other words, when you go to buy a house, there's a compromise. There's a negotiation. There's a price that they're asking. There's the price that you offer. They come down a little. You come up a little. They come down a little. Finally, you come to a compromise. And that's a great thing when you're buying a house. It's a great thing when you're buying a big item. But yet compromise has its limitations. When we believe in God, we must be wholehearted in or wholehearted out. Compromise will always cause difficulty. The one who is half-hearted in their service or means of following God, they're half-hearted in really going for God, will end up living as though there is not a God. I would submit to you also on the other side of the coin that the atheist who is not wholehearted atheist, who is not all in to atheism, will end up with compromise, which will cause him to live as though there is a God. 
Compromise is wonderful when you're buying a house. It's not good when you're trying to follow God, when you're giving everything you can to him in service to him in love in response to his love. Compromise. Aren't you glad that God did not compromise when he went to the cross for us? Aren't you glad that God didn't compromise when it comes to forgiving us of our sin because he forgives all of our sin? And so thankful that God didn't say, well, listen, you got these 200 sins. I'm going to take those away. But you've got 20 of them. I'm going to save those in my back pocket. I might need to use those against you one day to manipulate you. I'm glad that's not the God that we serve, right? He comes along and he says, I remove all of your iniquity and all of your sin. There's no compromise. There's no, okay, you do this and I do that. And then we come together to the middle. He just reaches down and says, I cleanse you and you are free. Aren't you glad about that? The third thing that this sword reveals is that most, the most valuable things in life cannot be divided. There are two basic things in life, and one is quantities and the other is entities. Now, a quantity can be divided, and there's really no problem. If you have 10 pounds of sugar, you can divide it in half. You have 5 pounds of sugar in this heap, 5 pounds of sugar in that heap. You still have 10 pounds of sugar. You have 500 acres of land. You can put 150 over here, 200 in the middle, 150 over there. You haven't really affected the 500 acres. You just put up fences. But you still have 500 acres because those are not entities. Those are quantities. But entities, when you try to divide an entity, you end up destroying it. Well, take your cell phone. Can you cut that thing in half and still have a cell phone? I mean, we can crack the screen and we're still kind of good, but you can't divide it. What about a rose? You can't take a rose and divide it in half. Husbands, I just suggest to you on your anniversary, don't go buy six roses, cut them in half and say, honey, here's a dozen roses. I'm just saying it might not turn out well. You can't do that. You can't take the Mona Lisa and divide it in half and still have the painting Mona Lisa. Nor can you take the Bible and and pick and choose what verses you want to use. You you just can't pick out the fluffy verses. You know, the good verses. Blessings, happiness, peace, joy, persecution. No, don't want that verse. Trials and difficulty. No, that's for other people. I just want the fluffy verses. You can't do that. You can't divide the Bible and still have the Bible, nor can you divide a baby and still have a baby. Because entities and quantities are two different things. We see in the, the, the people's wills, a couple, of, a, a father, a couple will divide their wealth among their children equally. And everyone gets a fair share was recently down visiting my father, and he wanted to give me a copy of his will. And I read it, and I'm in it, and I get an equal share. In that moment, there's going to be an equal division of whatever's there, and I'm in it. But there's a difference between distributing your wealth and distributing your love. You see, a mother's love is not equally distributed to her children. Every child gets all of her love because love is more powerful than wealth. And that's the way God is. God looks at you and he says, I'm I'm not giving you a portion of my love and you a portion of my love and you a portion of my love. He looks at every one of us and says, I'm giving you all of my love. Every one of us receives the entire love of God. How does he do that? Well, he's God. That's how he does it. That's the only explanation. He's God and he can give us all of his love to every individual on this planet. It's amazing. Aren't you thankful that you have a God that is like that and he gives us all of his love? And that's the last thing that the sword reveals. The sword reveals true love. Absolute, full-on, true love. Now, Solomon used the sword as a threat. He used the sword to show what could happen. And yet, it revealed the true love 
of that woman whose baby was still alive. Because she made a very interesting and powerful statement. She said, give the living baby to her. In other words, it was though she was saying, I will submit to death. I will submit to acting as though my son is dead. Give her the living baby. What a powerful analogy of love. What a powerful understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because you see, that's exactly what happened 2,000 years ago. There was a sword at Calvary. And it was raised up over Jesus Christ, the one who lived a perfect life, the one who had taught, who had loved, who had healed, had delivered, had walked on water, had performed miracles, had forgiven, had shown his grace and mercy. And then in the right moment, there was a sword that was raised up over Jesus Christ. But in this moment, it was not just a threat. It was not just simply for appearance. It was not just simply to make a point. The sword did not stop, but it came down on Jesus Christ on the cross. It came down on his head as a thorn of crowns. It came down on his back with the whip and the lacerations. It came down on his feet and on his hands. He suffered death so that... We could live. Jesus was saying, give them life, I'll take death. That's how much he loves us. He's saying, I want you to live, so I will take death. I will take the death that will free you to be your best To free you to be all that God's called you to be. To free you to walk in right relationship with God. I want you to live. I will take death. And in that moment, the sword was not just simply a threat. It was a reality. But the sword that fell on Christ at Calvary, crucifying him on a cross, is the very thing that gives us life. We live because Christ died. We have joy because Christ died. We have peace because Christ died. But aren't you thankful that not only did he die for us, but death could not hold him. And on Easter morning, he rose from the dead to prove he is the Son of God. He conquered death. He is alive. And because he is alive, we are alive in him. And so therefore, how then do we live? We live like the woman who was caught in adultery, who had a conversation with Jesus, and he said, you know what? I'm not going to condemn you. Go and sin no more. So many times we focus on the sin no more, and that's fine. But the first word he told her, he says, go. In other words, he said, don't meander around here. Go. Get busy with life. Go do life. Come on, get busy doing it. Get, Get busy Living life the way I want you to live, not in adultery, not in sin. Get busy. Go. Go do life the way I've called you to do life. And I say that would be a a word to every one of us today. God is saying to us today, because Jesus died on the cross, you are given life. Now go live life. Don't be afraid. Don't live life in fear. Don't worry He's saying, I want you to go live life and live it to the fullest. I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God turns that over and says, I give you life. How then do we live? We live just like John, the revelator. John, the one who was in the spirit on the Lord's day. The one who was suddenly in the spirit when God showed him a great revelation in chapter 4 and chapter 5 and beyond. He's called us to live in connection with the Holy Spirit. He says, I want you to go. I've given you life. Now go and live in that step by step by step with the Holy Spirit. So that's what I've called you to do. He said, I've given you the Holy Spirit because he's going to lead you into all truth. 
Jesus said to his disciples, there's many things that you need to know, but you're not ready for them now. But after I go back to the Father, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to teach you these things. He's going to lead you in this way. And so God is saying to us, come on, let's go live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Live in the abundance of the Holy Spirit. That's the way John lived, and that's the way you and I are to live. We're also to live like the Apostle Peter, who, though denying Christ three times, what did Jesus do in him and through him? Not, he, he restored him through forgiveness, but then he said, I want you to go preach the gospel. I don't think it was an accident. Peter was the one who preached the first message after the day of Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit is outpoured. The one who had denied Christ three times then preaches for about 15 minutes and 3,000 people are born again. He said, I want you to go and live in the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to go and live life to the fullest. I want you to go and present the gospel the way you're called to present the gospel. Not everyone's called to stand behind a pulpit and preach. Not everyone's called to sing. Not everyone's called to do any and all of those things. But you have been called by God to preach the gospel the way he's anointed you to preach the gospel. And he's saying, I've given you life. I've given you the spirit. I've given you my word. Now just go and do the deal. And he's called us to go and live. Are you living today the way God wants you to live? Are you living today in the power of his spirit and the greatness and awesomeness of forgiveness? We think about that sword being applied to Jesus Christ in that day, not a threat, but a reality. Then we recognize the fact that he's given us life. God has given you life. Amen? Amen. The band's going to come back up here. We'll have some more time of worship. God is saying to us today, I want you to live in the power of the Spirit because one died in your place. Now, you're here today. And you say, you know what, I'm checking Christianity out and I'm, I'm kind of meandering around and I'm trying to figure it out. Here's Christianity. Jesus Christ is perfect. Jesus Christ died on the cross. Jesus Christ rose from the dead so you can have life. That's the gospel. The invitation is given. The invitation of salvation is given. And now it's just a matter of saying, okay, I'm receiving that invitation. I'm opening it up, and I'm saying yes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes to the gospel. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come before you. And we thank you, God, that you gave us everything we need for life and godliness through Jesus Christ. And, Father, I just come against every distraction in this moment. That every person here today who is contemplating Christ, contemplating salvation, in Jesus' name, Lord, in this moment, this moment of salvation, they receive Christ. You say, you know what? I want to receive that gift of salvation. I want to receive the life that God has for me because I know I'm not living up to my fullest potential. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray and say, God, here I am. I'm, I've sinned and I need, a forgive, I need your forgiveness. Please forgive me of my sin. Please come into my life. Please, God, restore me. I want to live in right relationship with you. And that's only possible through Jesus Christ. I yield my life to you. God, take me. Use me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord.